we need to tell the story better from everyone's perspective. Uh, the role that the university is playing, the role that the communities are playing, the role of the organizations are playing, the city is playing, and the bigger picture, the role of everyone and how that all coming together will really change the future. Uh, I think that's what we really need to focus on. Welcome to The Brew. Today's episode is sponsored by Blackstone Launchpad at UCR, powered by Techstars, as well as the Office of Technology Partnerships at UCR. Today, I have two fantastic guests from UCR who are both entrepreneurs and residents. I have May Temraz and I have Mihai Patru. So to get the show started, I would like to hear a little bit more about your background, May, and about your journey to become an entrepreneur in residence. Thank you very much, Val. Uh, I came to the US four years ago with a Fulbright scholarship and I got my MBA with entrepreneurship focus from Cal State San Bernardino. Before that, I was uh, running and ma- part of a team running a startup accelerator in Gaza Strip. It was the only one and we were able to succeed in really creating an entrepreneurial ecosystem in a very complicated area. Uh, after I finished my uh, degree at Cal State San Bernardino, this the position, the position at uh, UCR was a perfect fit. So it really came aligned with uh, what everything I was doing and helping student entrepreneurs is something that I'm really good at and I, I really like. And that's how I uh, started working as the entrepreneur in residence for the Blackstone Launchpad at UCR. That's an awesome background, awesome story. Thank you for sharing. And then Mihai, how, for, how about for you? Hi Val, thank you for having us. Uh, I, I started my professional career with the Foreign Ministry of Romania and I was a career diplomat for about 12, 13 years. And my focus during that period was Middle East politics and economics. Uh, so in 2013, I came uh, to the US as a transatlantic diplomatic fellow with the State Department. So I was there for a year and then transitioned uh, working for um, a think tank that belonged to Johns Hopkins University for about a year. And that was the point where I decided to go back to school, go to grad school. And for about a year, I focused on conflict management and entrepreneurship. So that kind of made uh the transition for me from my diplomatic career towards more of a social impact oriented uh, professional path if i can say that and then your 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 um, major focus right now is on more social entrepreneurship that's correct it ha- yeah since i kind of you know discovered if you want to call it like that entrepreneurship i focused exclusively on social entrepreneurship and social impact And I've done kind of, you know, my, I've studied my own social businesses and Caravanserai project is part of this, uh, of my interest. And I joined uh, May's team about three months ago, I think. And and my focus with her and the other uh, members of the team is to focus on social impact and social entrepreneurship. Okay. So both of your backgrounds really do uh, stem from being in ecosystems where you have seen this kind of innovation grow and now you're both bringing that to UCR in different facets. Um, so the one thing I'm very interested in hearing uh, kind of from both of you is really um, what, it, what is your objective for kind of the UCR entrepreneurship, what you're trying to uh, do with the, the uh, whole Blackstone Launchpad, but these kind of uh, cross collaborations between different entrepreneurs and residents. Is there uh, an objective which both of you are trying to reach? I would say that mainly from the Blackstone Launchpad Perspective program is that we are trying now to get more undergrad students interested in entrepreneurship and starting their own ventures. Uh, UCR in all all the entrepreneurship uh, uh, efforts started recently. So just as soon as our boss Rosa Bolachoa reached, came to UCR and she started to implement a lot of programs and that when the entrepreneurial 
ecosystem at UCR started to really build and shine. And uh, all the programs right now are really trying to help students transform their research, commercialize it, and really try to build that ecosystem and get a good relationship and partnership with the city and the governor office and all that so that it's not just the university's offered, it's everyone's offer to really build that. So that's what trying to build relationship and as Mihai mentioned, it's now more going towards sustainability and helping with social uh, entrepreneurship. And how I see it from the undergrad student's perspective is that they don't like the word entrepreneur. They don't see themselves as entrepreneurs, but they really see themselves as changing the world, change makers, you know? So that is also why we're taking it from that aspect. But uh, it's a lot of efforts. Uh, it does take time. It's not something that uh, you'll see the results in one year. It does take time. And we're trying now for the long run and the long goals that hopefully uh, at, in I don't know, three to five years, you'll start to see that the ecosystem in the whole Riverside is really starting to build. And you'll see people, instead of leaving uh, Riverside to go work in Silicon Valley or even to the coast, that they are remaining and staying and joining other startups in Riverside uh, instead of leaving. And I think, you know, on the side of social entrepreneurship, to my surprise, when I came to the Inland Empire about three years ago, uh, and I started Seed Lab, which initially was part of the Center for Social Innovation, the idea of having social impact and was very much related to the nonprofit sector. Yep. And when we started recruiting for our first cohort of, for Seed Lab, a lot of people, you know, they've been doing work in their communities for years, huge impact. First of all, they never thought about themselves as entrepreneurs. So, you know, exactly what May was mentioning, I'm not even talking about change makers. Their main idea was, you know, I'm doing something for the community. Once you started talking to them and kind of not necessarily teach them, but explain them, you know, what they are doing is actually uh, impacting the community, has social impact, they immediately thought about, oh, so then I should start a nonprofit, which we are tr not necessarily that we are trying to discourage that path, but even if they decide to uh, adopt a nonprofit model and, you know, become a 501c3, they need to understand that at the end of the day, it's still a business. They will have payrolls to pay, uh, rent, uh, and just relying on donations and grants is no longer a sustainable way of doing business, even in the nonprofit sector. Yep. So I, I think that's a that's a really important distinction that that does really need to be kind of outlined to a lot of young entrepreneurs uh, because it, it is a very interesting space um, for a lot of young individuals. They do want to either be an entrepreneur or do fix a problem and, and it, a lot of it with social impact. But at the same time, um, it's very confusing of where to start um, because a lot of times uh, a younger entrepreneur is going to look at they, they see a problem and they want a solution for it and they're, they're gonna test it out. Um, even after they tested it out, um, understanding the different structures that they can go about to building that business is usually the biggest kind of blocking path for a lot of uh, younger entrepreneurs that might not have some background in business because they don't understand all the different fundamentals that are involved, which, which you just brought about like payroll, having an accountant understanding how to create the payroll systems, uh, make sure that everything's, um, when you actually get, if it's an LLC or a nonprofit, how do you legally go about the documentation for that? So the one thing I'm very curious uh, when it comes to uh, when it, the UCR kind of ecosystem, um, are there resources to teach the students all those steps of if, if they start, they should maybe start as a sole proprietor and then how do they shift to an LLC or a nonprofit? How do they go through each of those shifts and then how do they work with the county on those processes because each one has different documentation that needs to be submitted? So um, I'll start with the program that area. So uh, I don't know before that, but I know that now we do have and uh, uh, with the Blackstone Launchpad program, we do have a lot of uh, workshops and entrepreneurial programs that help students figure out how even from ideation to the IP patent part, uh, forming a company, market research, customer discovery, and all that. So all that is available. And I keep encouraging students is that now at what, um, as students, it is the perfect time for them to start something. Because first of all, they can access all resources on campus at no cost. Yep. 
do have a lot of mentors and mentoring programs that are available for them to guide them through the process. And even if they fail now as a student, they are not risking losing any money or even the embarrassment of failing as a founder outside. So they fail under the safe environment. They have all the support they need of the university. So it is a perfect time. They can fail once, twice, and three times and still uh, end up graduating with all the skills they needed and they have now the resilience they failed multiple times so if something happened now in real life they are prepared mm -hmm. so that's why we keep encouraged anything if you have any idea just look take advantage of all of the resources you won't believe that we do have programs like i for example that gives uh, and i might uh, talk a little bit more about it um, in a little but it gives students money to do customer discovery so it's not just also, they get fund to be able to do research and more customer discovery, but still not that much student take advantage of such opportunities. So I don't know if they are not aware, uh, we'll try to do better at that, or if they are just always worried that they won't get in. I really get a lot of students that just don't apply because they are worried that they won't get in. Yep. And this is just one program. This is the first step. And then there's so many other programs that takes the students after that. So with Epic SBDC, it's the small business program that when they will be a client and really form company and work closely with how to have an entity and go from there. So there's different programs. It's just they need to start. And I think being a student at a university is the perfect time to really start something like that. And uh, I think just, you know, something to add, uh, the fact that the university is building this pipeline, uh, mm -hmm. you know, starting from an idea to if that is successful and the student is interested in developing it and the feedback is positive or, you know, they learn, uh, you know, th there, is, there is a next step. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, that's what uh, will encourage a lot of students to, you know, test their idea and see, you know, if there is something more than just an idea there. And, you know, just having all these boot camps and meetings that May is organizing and, you know, ha then having i -Corps and, you know, eventually they will uh, join SeedLab where, you know, it's more of a, um, a, a more comprehensive eight month program when basically it's from testing their idea and developing the business plan. So I think, you know, having that perspective and, you know, if I'm successful at one stage, there is something else that will support my work. I, I think that's extremely important. And I don't think you can see that in many universities, uh, you know, studying entrepreneurship and social entrepreneurship obviously is something very fashionable nowadays yep. and any a lot of universities have pre-accelerators accelerators but you don't see a lot of um opportunities for students to just test an idea that they had yesterday and i think you know, that that's extremely important yeah, and I, I would have two questions for that, though. So one one thing I do hear from a lot of students uh, quite often when I, I know they're interested in entrepreneurship, but the one thing that usually holds them back is they say the same thing, which is, I don't think I'm experienced enough. So um, what would you tell those students that when they say, I'm not experienced enough, I'm going to wait until I work five to ten years and then try out my venture? I, I have my own response to it and I always tell them, but um, what would your response be to that question? That's a really good question because that's what I get as well, is that they always feel that they're still not ready and there's a lot of work that needs to be done. And to be honest, sometimes they just don't do anything and they abandon any idea that they have. So one of the things that we'll do is that we'll invite them to our meetings and then they will see that all of the other participants are at ideal, yeah. ideal level. And most of the students that I work with, because it's still the first step of the pipeline, is all ideas. It's just ideas that they got, sometimes they come with three, four ideas and they're all over the place. But that, that's why our programs are really just for, even even for students with no idea. So our startup would come, the first thing start with ideation for those who don't have ideas and are really interested in being entrepreneurs, but they don't have ideas. So they just come to see how, what are the techniques that they can really utilize to be able to get that perfect idea that they wanna work on. So we really start from early on. So one of the things is that we invite them to the network events and we invite them to just come and see 
And then when they see that they are not the only ones that are that level, then that at least breaks it a little bit. And we tell them is that if they don't test it right now, when it's just an idea, and then they put a lot of work in it, especially if it's a life, let's say it's an engineering idea and it's a prototype, and then they really put a lot of money and a lot of a lot of time in building that prototype, and then after going and testing it, they find that it's not the right thing, and this is this is not what the customers want, and now they really spend a lot of time, their time and their money developing something that the customer don't want. So it's really very important to do a lot of the research and the customer discovery very, very early on so that you're building something that people want. And it's not build it, then the customer come, that doesn't work. So they really need it. But it is a mindset. And I, I keep telling students, entrepreneurship is an entrepreneurial mindset and it requires time. So it does take time for us to be able to change that mindset. And for some of them, they just don't, come not because they are they still want to work on they just feel that um they won't fit or they won't get in or you know that's and they just uh, they cut themselves before they even apply or be, before they even come so that's another thing and one of the things that we started to do for that is that when we bring speakers one of the th topics that we started to really focus on is failure so we really ask a lot of the speakers to talk about how they failed and how they recovered from that. Because if you just keep bringing speakers that talk about their success and great achievements, then the student will see that we're never there. But yeah. just come and start talking about how many times they failed to be able to succeed this one time. Then the students will start to change their perspective and their mindset about that. And that's how they start. But it does take time. But you know, we need to be patient and really take it step by step. Yeah, and I think, you know, one thing that was also very important to all these, the speakers that May and the team have, have brought the students, a lot of them are from the region. Yep. A lot of them graduated from UCR. And I think, you know, in a region where um, it's, what I found at the beginning extremely hard to understand was geographically, it's very hard to connect with people. And you, you, you know, not that you don't want to be connected. You just, it's hard, it's challenging to find out what other people are doing. So bringing those people and offering local examples, people that started from, you know, were in the same situation and, you know, they were successful and they failed and then they tried again. I, I you know, I attended some of May's meetings and the speakers that she brought in, those were extremely powerful and that's something we've also seen at Seed Lab. We have, and May was one of the speakers, uh, bringing people that the participants can relate to easily. And you know, they had the same challenges when they grew up. They faced the same disruptions. And you know, people understand that well, that's possible. I, you know, you look at all these shows, Shark Tank, you know, all mm -hmm. uh, this, very interesting and educational shows, but in many cases, the people that are featured had, um, you know, support of the family. They had access to funding, and it's very hard for the majority of us to actually have a personal uh, understanding and, you know, be influenced by them. We are more influenced by their business model, but not necessarily when it comes to the personal story. And I think, you know, that has been extremely important to the, you know, the people that we've been working with. Yeah, definitely. I, I, I agree with that 100%. And I, I think the one interesting thing about entrepreneurship that's kind of, and it, it goes back to what both of you were saying is with these success stories and how it's getting glorified and all that. There's a weird false perception of entrepreneurship, what goes behind it. It's not an easy road. There's a lot of failures that are involved with it. Um, and that's usually the one thing I always try to tell students is that um, your own life experience is your best teacher. Like you're not going to learn this information from anything else except if you physically try it and fail and keep going and failing and failing and failing. That's the way I did it throughout undergrad. I, I tried five different ideas. They all failed, but that kind of led to the next one, which eventually started working out. But my knowledge from each failure is what got me to that next point, which eventually led me to building my business. So the other question I had in regards to what we're talking about with like developing the pipeline for entrepreneurship, especially connecting the ecosystem, 
is the ecosystem itself when it comes to Riverside and being able to really connect it together. Because the one disconnect that has been for a while, and I know it's getting bridged pretty quickly now, has been between Riverside County itself and the university as a whole. So building those relationships with the county as well as creating incentives for student entrepreneurs to want to stay in Riverside. Uh, because the other side of the equation, of course, is funding. Uh, because at the end of the day, there's not a lot of accelerators or incubators out in the IE as of right now. There's not a lot of angel investors and VCs. So what do both you see as kind of the, the future plans of where is, are things heading to make sure that that pipeline does come into existence so that ideas that come from ideation are actually able to become full viable business models at the end of the day so we can turn Riverside into what has been publicized as this innovation district um, in the future. As I mentioned, it's it's a long process and everyone needs to be part of that. So it's not someone's pers- responsibility to be to build that ecosystem. And uh, one of the, uh, from UCR side, uh, now the focusing on really turning the research that is done by the faculty and students and try to commercialize as much as can- possible and then with other programs that we have part of epic and spdc really try to find some initial investments for for uh, those uh, uh, startups to just start the movement yeah. and, and uh, to be honest at the beginning i think one of the things that we really can do better is highlight the success stories that we have we do have a great success stories and we do have a great accomplishment that if we highlight better then maybe it will start attract more investment and a lot of people will start to focus more in uh, into Riverside and the Inland Empire area but that's something that we need to do better at and another thing is um, we do have Excite that is the startup accelerator downtown and it's a collaboration between the city and the university and now there is a planning for Excite 2.0 and places like this really utilizing them by hosting events and bringing people inviting people and show them that there is thing a lot of things happening and it's a built up ecosystem that uh, it, we need all to really put efforts into building but the thing is with that sometimes people lose patience and they really think that it's just going to happen and in the meantime while we're still working on that we're losing talent a lot of the students that really good talent they just leave because they find better opportunities yes. so one of the things that we're trying is really make the startups here an attractive alternative that they really can start and see but if it's not attractive enough for them, it's very easy to just take a really good job in Silicon Valley and leave for there. But it does take time. And I think we are on the right track. And I think uh, we just need to keep doing what we're doing and be able to tell the story better, really tell, highlight the story. And not just from the university side, we need to tell the story better from everyone's perspective, uh, the role that the university is playing, the role that the communities are playing, the role of the organizations are playing, the city is playing, and the bigger picture, the role of everyone and how that all coming together will really change the future. Uh, I think that's what we really need to focus on. And, and I also think, you know, that uh, there has been a, a routine until now, and it, you know, it's still going on when people were, you know, okay, so what should they do next after graduation, you know, move to LA or, you know, just look for jobs in the more, in the bigger city, cities. But I think now you can see, and a lot of the people that we are working with, they left, you know, after graduation, but they came back. Yeah. And you know, even if you look at uh, cities like Indio, Coachella, or, you know, even Riverside, you meet a lot of people that went away for grad school or even get a nice job and now they are coming back. And in, even in Riverside, if you, you know, three years ago, there was no coffee shop that you could actually go work or meet people. Uh, a lot of um, workspaces have started being yep. developed. Uh, family owned stores or small businesses just walking around downtown Riverside, I think slowly starts to change and actually will encourage people to actually, you know, go downtown and walk. Because otherwise, three years ago, I remember there wasn't really much reason to go downtown. 
And I think you know, that will encourage people to actually, you know, young people especially that are looking, you know, for um, new opportunities to actually stay, spend more time in there, you know, Riverside or the cities around and just discover and see what are the, the possibilities there. Yeah, I, I, I definitely think the, the best way to have the ecosystem really grow is having the student buy-in and want to build the future of Riverside as a whole and having that kind of buy-in from everybody. Um, and, and allowing, like May, what you brought up is highlighting the success stories, but then really connecting all the individuals that are trying to push for the same objective together. Uh, because I, I've met so many entrepreneurs all over the IE. Every single one wants to see the Inland Empire become what is dreamed of becoming a mini version of pretty much Silicon Valley because we have everything set up for it but it really requires that mindset and the right skill sets to make it happen. Um, and definitely with the talent at UCR, there, there's no reason for that not to happen, but it really does require that buy-in. And a lot of people are moving from LA back here because the cost of living and the opportunities in LA as well have frozen to a lot of extent. So it, it is really shifting the way that people are perceiving the Inland Empire. And, and I think you know, the, the perfect example is Riverside Studios. Yep. I mean, you know, what Andrew and Kirby and the team have, you know, done there is pretty amazing. And, you know, bringing, you know, people like you and, you know, all the, these small businesses that some of them have been have been started by students. And I think, you know, that two years later, you are, you know, people are more interested and more offices are uh, refurbished and transformed. I think, you know, that shows uh, the need for such such spaces and you know people are actually are interested in staying and doing something and i just wanted to add that also one thing that might accelerate the process is focusing on what we can do best yeah so you can if really and that's what the university and especially the office of technology partnership is doing is focusing on areas that really the university is doing very good at and just put all the efforts onto certain tracks like ag tech uh, clean energy and water, things like that, that we really can excel in and mobility. So that really, uh, it's gonna accelerate that instead of just really focusing on everything and trying to do everything at once, because that won't happen and it's gonna take a long time and a waste of effort going everywhere. Yeah, no, I definitely agree with that. And that that's exactly why, especially kind of going back to what Riverside Studios and what at least my team is trying to do here to build an incubator inside the spaces to focus on the areas that maybe the university can to kind of fill in those ecosystem gaps because that's exactly what we talked about. Not everybody can solve everything, but if different areas are focusing on different aspects coming together, it can create that ecosystem that the Inland Empire really needs. And I think, you know, people should not expect the university, UCR, to actually do everything. Exactly, yeah. So, uh, the, obviously, the resource are, resources are limited, but also the expertise. So, you know, if there are, you know, different forces coming together, uh, you know, complement each other, I think, you know, that's when you will actually see uh, real results. Definitely. I agree with that 100%. Um, so the next thing I wanted to really talk about was uh, obviously we're talking about the way that the Inland Empire can grow and really create this entrepreneurial environment. But obviously, currently with the current situation, we have COVID-19 going on and it's it's impacting small businesses, nonprofits. It's impacting everybody, workers, two companies. So the one thing that I'm kind of interested in here from both your perspectives, working with a lot of startups and IE uh, and, and talking with nonprofits and for profits is what is this impact in is it, for example, the companies that are in the Inland Empire, um, do you do you see this as something that's obviously it's going to impact them for the long term, but that provides more opportunity afterwards for shifting the way that the businesses are done here? It's a kind of a tricky question, but. <laughs> yeah, I think it's, it's both. So uh, there's silver linings in what is happening right now, and it's tough times, but being able to survive those tough times, I see that uh, it helped global, even in just in the Netherlands, that the Inland Empire globally bring communities together, and uh, in all whatever capacities they can, can, every now now everyone now is now facing the same problem. So everyone came together, and I think that uh, this will really strengthen the the communities uh, afterwards post Corona pandemic, and uh, just emphasize on that. People need to work together 
the relationships are important, partnerships are important, and the organization that really helped during this, I think, will really stand after that. But it, it really also showed that startups, uh, small businesses, and entrepreneurs are very vulnerable. And yep. And they really, uh, that's why they got directly impacted with everything that is happening. And I think uh, maybe from this we'll learn that um, a lot of support needs to be done. A lot of policies need to be there. Uh, the infrastructure need to be different so that uh, I think sometimes you really need to learn the tough way. So uh, everything that's been done, we'll learn from this period and uh, hopefully there will be better plans and uh, policies and people will see that now the rule of the city and the government may come from from the small businesses and from the communities and from the small organizations that will lead to change in cities that will lead to change in the you know so uh, hopefully this will be the lesson lesson that we learn and it will bring people closer because even now this situation didn't discriminate. So, uh, yeah, that's how I see it. I, and you know, I think, you know, obviously th there is such an impressive collective effort and, you know, everyone is in, in, is in this together. There's really no way of going around it, you know. It's not like you can travel somewhere else and you are, you are safe. I mean, that's the reality. And I think, you know, what, what May mentioned, I think that's very true. On the other hand, I think, especially in the nonprofit sector, I think, or well, you know, I usually I call it like mission-driven organizations. You know, I don't want to necessarily uh, point to their legal status. Yeah. I think a lot of them will disappear, and maybe this is the time when, you know, unfortunately, it will disappear. But maybe this is the time that many of them, or many of us in this sector, have been. Uh, postpone that moment of rethinking and replanning their strategy, the services they provide, the impact they they want to achieve. Because I think you know that there was some sort of routine or comfort that they were enjoying, and now I mean it's that's it. Even in, you know if they are successful in getting some of the loans that the government or you know the county or the state uh, have been putting out that is go only going to help them for a few months so three months from now they will be in the same situation and i think you know those who will survive and will be successful are those who now are just you know they have the time now to just put everything on hold because whether they like it or not that's the reality and just rethink everything they do uh just you know thinking that they can continue the business model that they had six months ago i don't think that's going to work anymore yeah. and uh, i think there will be this gap of you know few months when you know everything there will be a lot of pressure on them um i think donors and foundations are kind of rethinking where they put their money uh so i think that that will be like you know um I don't want to say unnecessary shift, but uh, you know, I, I think the reality once we uh, leave the uh, pandemic behind, which who knows when that will happen. We, you know, you, you hear people saying, "Oh, I want to, you know, go back to what it used to be three months ago." I don't think that's going to happen. Yeah. Everything that will be from now on will be completely different. Yep. And you know, even you know, on a personal level, the way we interact, the way we travel, the way we you know appreciate things, I think that is going to change. And the same with the you know the business sector, small business sector, whether for profit, non profit, or you know whatever legal status they have. Uh, so the, the I, I agree with both those points, and I and I obviously there's going to be a shift. There's there's no way that there's not going to be a shift in business models and all that. But the one question I have is, do you think that that shift is going to be way more technology driven now, uh, because obviously of the virtual nature? I mean, universities had to go all online in a matter of a couple of weeks, and businesses some of them have are lucky enough that they can virtualize, some of them cannot. Um, so do you think this is going to push even more kind of a technology driven ac economy over anything else? I, I think, you know, first of all, just everyone is working from home. Mm -hmm. And I think company will realize that maybe, I don't know, a big percentage of their staff shouldn't have an office. Yep. They can, you know, just work from home and have, you know, meetings every once in a while. So, you know, just from there, 
Uh, and I was reading some reports the other day that, you know, Zoom, which we are using now, it's one of the most, the, rich, the richest company now. And, yep. you know, you could never imagine that a few months ago. Uh, and I think, you know, yes, technology will, you know, be definitely even, you know, my parents are embracing it. Uh, you know, that's the reality. But on the other hand, I think, you know, you hear more and more people saying, oh, you know, I can't wait to actually interact with people directly. So I think the way we, we will appreciate like human direct interaction uh, will change as well and will not be taken for granted. Uh, so I think, you know, that will be, um, you know, businesses that have also focused on that, who knows, may, maybe that will be in their advantage if you know, that's the case. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I, I agree with that 100%. I, and I do agree that um, at least on the service sector side, people do want that face-to-face -face interaction. I think this is the one thing, the positive side of this is it's going to change the way that the restaurant industry was going towards, how they were actually digitalizing very quickly. I think that the that's going to stop that. Um, and cause actually more face-to-face -face interaction on that front for the service industry. But then anything that can be product-based or anything that's uh, a lot of different services now can still be shifted to a kind of a technology approach. Um, and then the workforce. I, I do think that the workforce is drastically going to change after this because for a company that's more economical as well, you can downsize your overhead costs by having a work, virtual workforce and then just relying on certain activities that require day-to-day -day operations to be together to be in the office and everybody else can be remote. Yeah, and also, you know, like services that companies used to have access to that now are, you know, they find they are looking for cheaper ways of, um, you know, buying them. So, you know, you have all these online services that are, I think, you know, uh, that will, uh, you know, I think those companies will be very successful. Yep. So the, the next thing I really want to talk about is tying back into obviously this is impacting a bunch of businesses in general. So there, there are some resources that um, small business owners, entrepreneurs can take advantage of the SPDC um, and as well as local community leaders and business and all that. But um, I know, Mihai, for you, you have your own um, company, uh, the Caravan Sarai. So can you talk a little bit more about what that Caravan Sarai project is and what you're trying to do with it and how you're supporting the communities with that? Well, I, I want to first say, you know, Caravanserai project is a non-profit. Yeah. The, the reason it was created as a non-profit, it was just, you know, for you know, the legal status. Mm -hmm. And we are applying for grants, we get donations. That was the only reason, uh, you know, on paper is a non-profit. In reality, you know, we are trying to combine uh, both uh, you know, generate our own revenues through the consulting that we are doing, the uh, training programs that we are delivering and kind of, you know, not rely on grants and donations. Yep. And, and uh, kind of, you know, going back to, you know, why Caravanserai project was started and May has become familiar and, you know, kind of joined some of our projects, uh, whether she liked it or not, she just, you know, we liked her and it's okay, you're, you're with us. Uh, the initial idea was that the team that fun founded the organization, we were running, working with independent change makers, social innovators, and none of them wanted to actually build a structure around them have a legal status or, you know, in many cases, you know, what you were talking earlier, a lot of them had no clue how to do that. Yep. And on the other hand, you know, it was expensive. They didn't have time to do it. All they wanted was to focus on their idea. And that's how, that's why Caravanserai project was started initially, just provide that support. Uh, long story short, 2020, we are in Inland Empire full time and for the last three years we've been working with the university and different other organizations in the region, mainly focusing on mission driven organizations. And we started Seed Lab in partnership with the Center for Social Innovation at UCR, which was initially designed as a pre-accelerator for very early stage social entrepreneurs in the region. And not only students, we had students as well, but out of the 12 uh, ventures and entrepreneurs that were working with us, 
I'd say 80% were from all over region. Indio, uh, Palm Springs even, uh, San Bernardino, Riverside. It, it, it was, it's a very uh, eclectic and you know diverse group. And the second co cohort, who's about to finish hopefully in May with all these changes, uh, it, it's you know the same. I would say 90% of them are women. Uh, I would say 70% of those who have been in the program are not in their late 20s. There are people that um, have been working, developing their idea, their venture as a hobby for years. Yep. And they actually never thought of some of them as transforming their passion to you know, help the community into a business that they could own and you know eventually leave to their uh, children and you know uh, provide jobs in the community so it's really th that's how everything started uh, going back to COVID-19 and everything that has happened in the last few months you know that also for us has pushed to rethink the entire model yep. and we realized that uh, mission-driven organizations not only here but in you know in general they just now they need support and it's that you know they are forced to just rethink what they do so with ucr and an organization called the inland empire community collective we started a loan application assistant program uh, which was launched a week ago and basically it's open to both mission driven organization and for profits uh, which are exploring applying for one of the cares act loans and they sign up online they ask for assistance if they are mission driven nonprofits mainly we work with them or the partnering organization iecc is providing support if they are small businesses for profit we um th they will have the support of ucr and uh, their entrepreneurs in residence uh at ucr so we, we are we've been trying to cover uh, you know all the aspects the other thing that we've been doing is we started a series of webinars that are extremely practical i mean i think you know nowadays all of us have you know five six zoom calls just about resources and I, what we realized you know just hearing from our partners here that people are tired of listening you know there is this opportunity or this other resource but no one actually telling them okay these are the steps that you should follow so we've done that uh this wednesday on the 15th we have the third a webinar in the series series and we just talk about like very practical things yeah. 45 minutes max and you know we have checklists guides that and you know we got feedback from different organizations that you know they are extremely uh, helpful and the last thing that I want to mention was you know I was mentioning talking earlier about survival and sustainability uh, we develop a master class, a training program that initially was supposed to, you know, be in person, which obviously is not the case anymore. So we are taking that online and it's basically, uh, we are working with very, with about 10, 12 uh, leaders, CEOs of mission driven organizations that are more advanced and just walking them through a list of things that will help their survival and sustainability. We are not. Uh, we are not interested in providing um, a very general approach where we are just telling people, okay, these are the main things that you should consider. You know, now you can go back to your board or your staff and just figure out by yourself how you're going to do this. Yeah. You know, we realize that that's not going to work. So what we will do, we have. You know, we developed our own concept, our own curriculum and just working with them, uh, you know, in a way holding their hands to just apply to their own organizations and, you know, kind of take it from there. And I, you know, uh, working with UCR and uh, I think that we managed to cover through our all, you know, joint efforts, 
both the mission-driven sector and the small businesses. Yeah. And I think nowadays, regardless of you know your organization, what kind of legal status you have, most of them are facing the same challenges. They are in the same situation. Yeah, definitely. And it's it's awesome to see, obviously, what you're doing with your your company, as well as seeing what the SPDC is doing and how everybody's really trying to give back and really work as that community, provide those webinars, provide those classes, provide the resources. And the one thing I do agree with is a lot of times people like point out the resources, but not necessarily how to go about them. And that's a big problem because in, in my case with when, with my mom, she's a she's a business owner of her own but she doesn't have any background in business. She doesn't know how to go through these loan applications or any of these things. So I'm walking her through that, but luckily I can help her out. A lot of times you don't have that support behind um, your business. And the way the assistance program uh, works, you know, they sign up, there is a form that they have to fill out just for the volunteers who have been trained to kind of get a better sense and you know, get prepared. And you know, there are people who have already applied for the loans, for example, and you know, they just need uh, some support, even if it's like, you know, mental support and, you know, just somebody that they can talk to and they can get some feedback, some confirmation, or, you know, just listen, you know, hear the latest updates. Because I think it's impossible nowadays with so many resources to just spend all your day trying to figure out, you know, what happened five minutes ago. Exactly. You know, a lot of people actually are still doing their jobs and, you know, they want to work with the community, you know, keep their business afloat. You know, they cannot just focus on the latest resources. Yeah, definitely. So the next topic that I would love to talk about a little bit more, um, and it kind of ties off all these resources that have existed for COVID-19 and what we talked about the entrepreneur ecosystem at UCR. But the one thing I really want to talk about um, especially is the, the resources that do exist at UCR and really kind of tying into those. We, we briefly touched on a lot of those um, opportunities that students have, but I think it's important to list out pretty much all of them and as well as uh, that students know that they're still existent. Even if school is down, uh, those opportunities are still for students so that this time frame you can still push forward with your ideas and really give back to community or support startups or whatever you really want to do, but those resources exist. Um, so... Don't, correct me if I'm wrong, but the main resources as of right now are the i program, Blackstone Launchpad, OTP Office, um, and we have, um, obviously we have the C-Lab partnerships that are tying in. Is there any other ones that I'm missing? Uh, SPDC will be the only one part of that. So um, just to make it, it's a lot of programs and uh, a lot of confusion sometimes. So mainly everything is under the Office of Technology Partnership, all other programs, the partnership with Seed Lab, the Blackstone Launchpad, Epic SPDC, and the i program. So I will start with uh, the program I'm running, the Blackstone Launchpad Network that is powered by Techstars. It started at UCR uh, last fall, and it mainly focuses on helping students succeed in entrepreneurship and in their careers. So it's not just about helping them start businesses, but also give them the skills that needed for them to be able to succeed in finding great job opportunities and succeed in their careers. And uh, with the uh, Launchpad program, uh, what mainly it's the first pipeline. It's really just being able to reach all the students, by all of them from all disciplines. And we try to really focus that this is not just for people. Uh, students think of entrepreneurs as inventors, uh, the engineers, that's it. So we really try to reach out to uh, humanities and arts and uh, business students and really try to change the mindset about entrepreneurship and just bring them to uh, very basic workshops and networking events just to get their first step into this uh, roadmap of uh, you know all other resources that's available. And what the Blackstone Launchpad have is first of all all of our programs are still happening all virtual nothing changed nothing stopped so we do have a startup boot camp that is happening start from ideation it's a five week long ideation ip and company formation customer discovery branding and pitching and it's mainly even for students who doesn't have ideas but just want to learn the skills uh, the other thing is that we do have mentoring sessions that are available for all students all the time and uh, this is really a great opportunity for students to who are having idea but really uh, need some guidance in different areas is that we're able 
being part of the Blackstone and Techstars, we're able to connect them with mentors from both companies. And this is like huge. It's really a great connection. And this is one thing. The other thing is that we do have office hours that happens every month with an IP lawyer, a legal lawyer, and we're trying to add to that just because also um, the policies with undergrads and their IP is different than grads and their IP. So sometimes they just need the consultation and having that uh, free first consultation within the university is really very important. And finally, we really have a great cool opportunities for, for us to send students to uh, very big events and one example is the one that uh, you and Ethan were able with part of Edge Sound Research is you you got to uh, be able to pitch on stage at CES which is the I think the biggest consumer electronic show in the world so opportunities like this is really important it gives the students the motivation and gives them the exposure that they really needed to believe in what they are doing and that um, there's a lot that they can still put in and then after we finish with the lunch pad and all the basic and put them on the first step then there's i -Corps. and i is um, funded by the national science foundation and it mainly helps students be able to do customer discovery so that they validate their ideas and it's a seven week long and they receive funding to be able to do that. They receive funding to be able to attend a conference that will help them do more customer discovery or travel or do initial prototyping. And the main reason for this program is to help students be able to say if it's a good idea that they really need to start working and put more money and efforts on it, or it's, it needs to be pivoted into something different. Customers need something else, change it, or it's totally not a good idea that they need to start thinking of something else. So it's really a very good thing to start with. And they learn a lot. The skills that they learn in the process is huge and it's things that will help them even after they graduate. And then they start to go if they finish and continue and the idea is great and the i core proved that and they are on the right direction, then there comes more experience and professional programs like Epic SPDC where they get one of the entrepreneurs and residents to guide them through the process. They are now a formed company. They start to seek funding either by applying for different grants or by uh, pitching to different VCs and they get their initial funding. And after that, there's Excite, the down, Riverside Downtown Accelerator, or there's Seed Lab if they are more uh, mission driven. And uh, it's, uh, as Mihai mentioned, we have a really broad map and every program feeds to the other so that students don't feel abandoned, that they finished one step and now they don't know where to go and they feel like, uh, what now? So I, I feel like students need a milestone or a guideline that if you finish this step, now you can do this and there's this that you can do. And as I mentioned, and I keep mentioning this, being a student now is the perfect time to, it's a win-win situation. If a startup succeeds, then now they are a startup founder and they can do, go this direction. If it doesn't succeed, they've learned a lot and just putting the, that they've done a startup during their time as entrepreneurs and their resumes will add a lot and they will really be able to start hunting good opportunities because that's skills that they don't just uh, learn by attending classes and that's it. So it's a win-win situation and um, yeah, I hope I covered all of them. So for now, everything is virtual. The Startup Bootcamp is still up and running. We have a social innovation pitching competition. The deadline is still uh, around the corner. Uh, we do have the office hours still happening, the mentoring sessions are there. So everything is still the same. The whole program are just virtual and uh, we're 100% working. That's that's awesome to hear how the university has really evolved from the time that I have actually was a freshman here because when I started at UCR in my undergrad, uh, it was five and a half years ago now, um, when I walked in there, there wasn't even i then. Um, it was, it was, there was nothing on campus and I, I really wanted to pursue entrepreneurship when I came to UCR, but I didn't really find anything. And not until about my third year when i was introduced, I was like, oh, this is awesome. And then seeing how every single thing is getting added on, I can really see how that pipeline is being developed in real time. Um, and I can kind of vouch for what opportunities that provides for students. And if you cannot, if you're not, 
necessarily interested in maybe starting a startup now, but you at least want to try it out. The connections you make from going through those processes also is so valuable in your long term career because you'll meet other entrepreneurs or other individuals that are aspiring to do something maybe in your same space, or same uh, interests. So that's the other really big benefit of joining these programs and interacting with the entrepreneurs and residents as well as other students at UCR. I also think, you know, they uh, the new students will see the um, uh, you know, they'll have you as an example or other entrepreneurs that went through, you know, attended some of these programs or, you know, the entire program. And I think, you know, that will increase awareness and will uh, inspire people, you know, to just become interested yep. and, you know, uh, develop their concepts and basically, you know, just explore what they, they think it works. And, you know, as May said, they, you know, obviously we would like everyone attending all these sessions to, you know, uh, be successful and start their business. But I think, you know, at the end of the day, you gain so many skills just listening to people or, you know, doing some of the um, uh, requirements or, you know, just attending the pitching competition. I think, you know, these are things that uh, will be extremely valuable long term and you'll actually, you know, you, you will definitely, they will definitely use this you know, within their career, whatever, you know, whether they are an entrepreneur or, or not. Yeah, definitely. And the, the one thing I think is um, what I'm actually very interested in hearing from both you is obviously these resources exist. And, and now during COVID-19, obviously, everybody's still at home. They're doing their classes at home. And unfortunately, some people don't have jobs and all that. But this is really the time for innovation to drive forward. Uh, Mark Cuban had a very good uh, interview where he talked about how what's really going to lead the economy out of this situation is entrepreneurship um, out of everything else, because innovation is the only thing that will kind of spur the change. Um, since what we talked about, business models can't really be the same after this uh, whole situation. So um, at least in more on the social entrepreneur side, where do you think these opportunity gaps really are starting to exist? I, I definitely see there's a lot now in um, education tech as well as workforce development. Um, but where, what else should students right now, if they're interested in maybe coming up with ideas, what should they be focusing on? Maybe you want to They will say that maybe now also environment will be another thing that bioengineering and all this with the will be another place where students will focus on. Maybe we started to neglect the environmental impact for a little bit but i think with uh, everything that's happening now students will go there more and i think also this generation is more focused on social impact than the older one uh, all students i meet with even if they have a technology uh, based uh, uh, idea they still try to see how it can be have a social impact and how it can really help so they are really conscious about the social impact of whatever ideas they are working on. So I think environmental impact will be a big one. I think the fields that the areas that UCR are focusing on will still be important. Like ag tech is still an important, clean energy will remain important. Uh, bio, bioengineering is an, another great one. So I think those will still remain the same, but. Now the technology ones will, uh, delivery will be uh, another big one. So now delivery is uh, like kind of online uh, education will be another one that people will focus on. And um, I think also now it's going to be more globally and internationally. We are facing this together. So now with more into technology and all that, it's going to be more globally that people will start to uh, work together more, things that really bring everyone together. So uh, I think I don't know what you want to add, Mihai, to that. I think that, you know, at Seedla, but also, you know, some of the people that I met through UCR, there has there has always been interest in mental health. Yep. And, uh, but I think in many cases, it was assumed that it's, ha it's a process that has to be in person. Mm -hmm. And I think, in every seed lab cohort, we had at least two organizations or two startups that were focusing on mental health in a different form and format. And I think, you know, at the end of, you know, this crisis, a lot of this mental health focus will add the digital component. And I think, you know, 
the fact that obviously you know uh, there is a lot of need for support in this sector that that has always been there but i think now with these uh, restrictions in you know meeting in person people are forced to uh, innovate and think creatively and take what they've done in you know on a digital pl platform and there is one example that i want to give in the first seed lab cohort we had a very uh inspiring organization in india it's called dansa sitla klonak and basically what they there are two sisters involved gabby and claudia armenta and they've been working on developing um dancing and talking circles based on aztec traditions and they were organizing this in the communities and you know it was a hobby they they attended seed lab and you know we've been working with them on their business plan obviously they did the the heavy lifting and um they actually started putting a business together you know they have a structure a business plan and they became uh, extremely popular in the region uh, before you know last summer they got a lot of press for what they they've been doing but now because they cannot perform they cannot meet their beneficiaries they cannot organize talking circles circles or dancing circles so i think about a week ago they had their first online talking circle and you know they can do that and still provide support to their communities yeah. their beneficiaries you know it, it will not be in person, but the work will be the same. And, you know, I think they will even reach uh, even wider audience because they will not be limited by, in, you know, the community in India or, uh, you know, uh, Eastern Coachella Valley. Now they can, you know, have people attending their uh, performances and meetings, you know, from all over the world. One of their biggest issues when they were actually meeting in person was that some of their meetings were canceled because they didn't have a physical space to actually organize any, you know, in the summer when there are like, you know, 40, 45 uh, Celsius, degrees Celsius, it, it was impossible to meet in the park. Now, you know, that issue is no longer there. They can do their work every day, uh, just doing it online. And they started doing that. So I think, you know, that will be a big, uh, that we'll see a lot of innovation there, like mental health, um, you know, people are suffering now, you know, five, four weeks into this crisis, everyone has been confined at home. There's got, there will be a lot of things happening into this sector. Yeah. I, I will just add is that the only way sometimes to force people to try to find innovative yeah. solutions and innovative alternative is a crisis. And uh, I think this will really force people to start to find innovative solutions. And after this day, we will find that this might be a better way for them to succeed and even exactly. their customers and be more uh, productive. So sometimes you just need to get that stress that forces you to work and try find an alternative to just survive. And I think here where great ideas come and uh, I mean, we keep monitoring and we're seeing how things are changing. I think even with schools that are now, they are all over the place trying to find online classes and be able to keep the school going. But I think it, when they figure it out and it's set up, this will be a huge thing for schools even that now they are set up and uh, a lot of homeschooling might also be different that it can be done now and they can still participate while being from home so a lot of things will change yeah i agree with them I mean, I... and I, I think you know not only that they will have you know wider audience but also they will identify tools that will allow them to do their jobs cheaper Yep. And, you know, that will, I think, encourage small organizations that have tremendous impact with their work just explode. Yeah. And, and the, the one really um, interesting thing is usually during crisis situations where, when it's the biggest shift in uh, market share for companies, small businesses compared to corporations, due to the fact that the consumer wants that change or that innovation when they come out of that crisis. And if everybody's still and you're developing these digital platforms of digitizing what you're doing and figuring out your tech stack and all that, you can leapfrog over all your competitors 
and when you come out of the crisis everybody will recognize your brand for that um, so this is a huge opportunity as well it is obviously a disaster situation but it's a huge opportunity for uh, entrepreneurs that currently are working on something to make something that will accelerate faster post this situation then even if it was everything was perfectly fine right now and they're just growing at a normal pace i also think you know that because of these constraints and you know uh, a, a lot of organizations will not only rethink the way they work but also they you know i, I think we'll see more and more collectives and yeah. different organizations different individuals with different different skills, uh, different resources, will just come together and you know work, de develop projects where everyone is involved, and you know they will bring their share of resources and talent uh, to actually deliver their work. And you know, obviously, you know the, they will that will cut cost, and we I think you know that's kind of also something that we will see. Yeah, I agree with that. So the, the way that we like to end the show, uh, and we, we touched on a lot of the topics and, and it always boils down to this last point that the way we always want to end the, the Brew podcast is just really providing um, advice to entrepreneurs, young entrepreneurs, um, or even older entrepreneurs, anybody who really wants to get in that space, um, just how to get started or what they should be focusing on, um, whatever advice that you've, as an entrepreneur yourself, have uh, received or learned. Um, that's what we really want to give a platform for you to share that. So um, either of you wants to go first and provide a little bit of advice to young entrepreneurs. May, would you like to start? <laughs> I'm putting you on the spotlight. I will start by first, start somewhere, anywhere. They need to start. The first step sometimes it's, that it's the one that takes longer. But when they start, everything starts to go after that. So start anywhere. And if it's for students, I would really recommend again and again, take advantage of the resources available on campus. If you have any idea, just go ahead and start something, try something. You will learn a lot in the process and the skills that you will learn will help you succeed after that. So even if the idea that you start while student doesn't succeed and then when you graduate, you decide to start your own business, you will learn everything that you will need fi financially, how to start a company, how to do your payroll, all that. You will have all that skill and it's going to help you succeed with that. And finally, one of the things that helped me individually is when I started to celebrate my failure. So if you really start to look into failure differently and not be embarrassed by failing because to be honest, the times that I've learned most most in my life was when I failed. So I've done three social businesses and I failed in the three of them. And that's how I've learned in the process of failing and then succeeding, figuring out another way of doing it and why you failed and you learned. So just embracing failure and celebrating it and sharing it and um, consider it as part of the journey. If you don't fail, then there's there won't be the succeed at the end. So that's another thing, just apply to the opportunities and uh, put yourself there and trust in your abilities and trust in the things that you can give and be there, just put yourself there, start and embrace your ideas and embrace failure and uh, start somewhere. That's perfect. Perfect. Uh, I, I think that's kind of like the trickiest question <laughs> uh, because you know you read all these success stories and you know you, you never know what that very successful entrepreneur now has been going through. You know what were their resources at the beginning? Some of them were more fortunate, fortunate than others. But I, I think you know what I've learned you know, my, on my own uh, time and but also you know working with a social entrepreneurs I, I think you know what almost always you know kind of helps them is not get stuck in the sense you know if you fail kind of you know start again with the same idea i mean no one expects you to have uh you know an amazing second idea but maybe just your first idea just rethink it and maybe there was something wrong there or maybe you realize you know it wasn't worth your time and just stop it before it actually hurts uh i think you know that's kind of you know there are so many things happening there and i think nowadays it's so easy to 
learn to find out and learn what other people are doing you know from all over the world and i think you know you just google something that sounds similar to what you want to do and see you know if it works and you know i i always you know say at seed lab that it's unlikely to have you know an idea that no one has thought of you know like the pro i'm sure there are especially you know in technology but i think you know in general that's maybe like 0.01 percent uh, so, you know, why, uh, you know, not learn from what other people have done and, you know, learn from their successes and, you know, as May said, their fa failures. And I think, you know, just being part of the conversation, not necessarily uh, directly involved, but just, you know, listen and read. And I mean, there are so many blogs and Facebook pages and LinkedIn. And I think, you know, it's just only if we had time to just read everything but i think you know that kind of you know just being engaged at least in the sector in which that person is involved and in the sector in which they want to do something i think you know knowing what's happening there i think that's very important yeah no i i 100 agree with that and i mean it, it's important to really understand you're going to fail a lot and as well as look at those failure stories that, that's the one thing i always emphasize to the business school as well as they should always tell more failure stories and success stories um because it really does teach you a lot about where you need to go and what you've done um and i and i one thing i really do want to emphasize is definitely googling ideas that you have you should do that first um uh, and see what exists and uh, i will uh, add something to what mihai said after listen is listen listen and don't be stubborn because sometimes they think that see, they have the best idea and even that mentors keep telling them that and they interview customers and all signs telling them that it's not working but they are still stubborn that it is working and sometimes it's just changing one small thing you don't need to change the whole idea and by googling sometimes if you just add a small thing to an existing solution or exchange one thing to an existing solution you might have a much better so it doesn't have to be and totally new solution. Yep. You may be using an app, but it's missing. It's missing something, or you can add something that's make it much, much more, be much better. So it's don't be stubborn. Listen and do research. A lot of research, and I keep telling them now, everyone home research. If you have an idea, now is the best time to research it from everywhere. Yeah, I know that that's true. And uh, you know, just one last thing. When when May came, I think. Seed Lab uh, last year when we started this, this new cohort, she started with the failures. And I think everyone was surprised because, you know, they were kind of painful, but I think, you know, she built it in such a way that, you know, there were so many lessons that you can learn from there. Yeah. And, you know, it's, uh, yeah, just, I think that's extremely important. Well, May and Mihai, I really appreciate you both being on the Brew Podcast and providing all your experience, your knowledge, and really detailing out all the resources that exist in the Inland Empire. I think that's one thing that really does need to get broadcasted more so people really understand the opportunities that are are here and present. But uh, once again, I really do appreciate both of you being on the show today. And um, that's it for the Brew.